Well, turn with me, if you would, to uh, the book of Romans. Romans 12, and we will be looking today at verse 16. Romans 12, 16, I'm going from the New American Standard Version, which here is far more accurate to the original than several other translations, including the NIV. The NIV has not a translation, but an interpretation, and so um, I'll be going from the actual word-by-word -word translation for Romans 12, 16, which is in this case in the New American Standard Version, where Paul says, be of the same mind with one another, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. We've been seeing that uh, Romans 12 and 13 are all about the qualities of true Christianity, uh, qualities, fruits of the Spirit, really, uh, as opposed to just a list of do's and don'ts, the qualities that make our faith real. And that's good because a lot of people think that Christianity is really all about hypocrisy. They think that the churches are full of people who tell, you know, everyone else what to do with a list of do's and don'ts, people who generate a lot of heat, maybe, but who don't really practice what they preach. And unfortunately, all too often, they're right. And so the first thing that Paul does after 11 chapters of analyzing uh, the Christian faith doctrinally is to show us how to actualize it practically, not in other people's lives, but in our own lives. How to generate not more heat with the truth that we try to change everyone else with, but to generate more life and more love with truth that changes us first. So when it comes to application, Paul begins with you and me. As much as Christianity is about what comes from our lips in terms of the truth that we speak, it's equally about the quality of our lives that back up the truth that we speak. It's about the music of the gospel that's got to support, to back up, to uh, convince uh, through the words of the gospel. Shining our light before men. Qualities that come, as we've seen, not from ourselves. That's the good news of the gospel. What qualities that come by the Spirit, as Paul says elsewhere, through faith in the truth. And then his word does its work in our lives. We saw a few months ago that Paul began here in verses 3 to 8 with the quality of humility. And now in verse 16, he brings it up again. So important is it. But this time he uses different words to flesh it out in a different way. Again, he says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. So why would this quality, the quality of humility, be so important that it would show up twice in the space of a single chapter where he lists the cream of the cream when it comes to practicing our faith? John Calvin, the great theologian, once said that there are three essentials to true Christianity. He said the first is humility. And if that's so, what do you think the second is? Humility. And the third is humility. If the creator is holy, 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 then the creature of all things ought to be humble, humble, humble. Because if we could only see how far we've fallen from his glory, even as Christians, that would be fundamental to who we are. Humility is fundamental to how we become Christians uh, in the first place, and it's fundamental to how we grow as Christians in the second place. It is uh, one of the fundamental qualities of true Christianity. Of all the qualities that Paul lists in these two chapters, there are only three that he brings up two times. The, the first is brotherly love or charity, as we've already seen, the second is mercy, and we'll see it the second time next week. But the third this week that is mentioned two times is humility. And here in Romans 12, 16, at the heart of this verse, Paul gives us really the ultimate signs and secrets of true humility, as I've titled this message. He says, be of the same mind toward one another. And then here's the heart of it, out of which a lot of it grows. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. And then he concludes, do not be wise in your own estimation. Now, as we unpack this verse, this is rather typical of Paul. It's much like what's called a, a chiasm in the Greek, where on either side of his main point, he reinforces it by saying the same thing, but in a different way. Again, 
the heart of the teaching is at the heart of the verse in the middle phrase. And on one side of the phrase, he says that we're to be of the same mind with one another, which is one part of humility. And on the other side of it, at the very end, he says, do not be wise in your own estimation, which is another part of humility. And then in the middle, the heart of it, he says, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly, which is really, we're going to see today, in a lot of ways, the heart of humility. It's the sign and secret of true humility. And that is, as we'll soon see, the degree to which we associate with the lowly. But let's start at the beginning. On the front side of the verse, Paul says that we're to be of the same mind. And again, this is the literal translation, which is what I'm going from. We're to be of the same mind with one another, with other followers of Christ. This has to do with our relationship with the church. Not being of the same mind means that in some way you're holding God's people with arm's length. You know, maybe with your nose held high. That's the idea here. And the idea is that if you're holding the church at arm's length, it's likely pride that's making you do it, the opposite of humility. I never thought of that that way until I ran into this verse. At one time, um, I thought that they were the prideful ones, the ones in the church. Little did I know that it was actually me. As I pointed the finger at them, little did I know that there were four fingers pointing back at me as I kept my distance from God's people. Paul's talking about a camaraderie, kind of, with the people of God here, and he's saying that the opposite of that can be a kind of, a kind of snobbery. And so one key step to true humility for a lot of people is to become part of God's people in a meaningful way. A lot of Christians aren't. It sure was true for me. I was, it was a very humbling move to come to church. I felt, it felt like I was joining, and this is how my sno a snobbery way back then, this was back in the early 70s, just after high school, I, it, it felt like I was joining a bunch of sheep, you know, mindlessly parading to church, which said a lot more about me than them, I found out later. It all began back in high school when, for a number of reasons, I backed away from hanging out with Christians. And slowly but surely, something happened. They say, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well, that may be true with some people, but when it comes to the church, the opposite is what's usually true because in your absence, your separateness, so often makes you not fonder but harder, even bitter. Distance creates disdain and even disgust among when we stay away. Even if you weren't angry when you left, and all the more if you were angry when you left. I began to scorn the church and all these little groups and activities and all the lingo and all the sheep mindlessly flocking to the fold every week while all the rest of us, you know, were doing sensible things on Sunday morning. Like sleeping in, like reading the paper, like hiking, skiing. I mean, really, all they're doing at church is preparing for eternity. Got to the place where the negatives were all that I saw. Because, you see, distance uh, creates stereotypes, and you start to paint all the warts red. So easy to do that with people, with your spouse, with friends, and with the church. And finally, that's all you can see, and you start to imagine some that aren't even there. I went back through, uh, I went through several years of separation before God brought me back. And you know something? I never got my act together in life until I threw my lot in with the whole lot of them, for better or worse. With the church, warts and all. My high-mindedness over them only left me when I became of the same mind with them. Because so often the opposite of camaraderie is snobbery. The opposite of commitment is contempt. And it'll be one or the other. And it's not just me. In my experience over the years, over the last 30 some years as a pastor, not always, but often it is either or. You'll be of the same mind, warts and all, or you'll be of a separate mind and you'll start painting all the warts red. It's just what happens. 
becomes the devil's playground when you're distant. So which will it be, commitment or contempt? And really, it's not only contempt for God's people, it's contempt for our own good. Because according to Proverbs 18.1, he who separates himself seeks his own desire and quarrels against all sound wisdom. Let me read that again. He who separates himself seeks his own desire and quarrels against all sound wisdom. That's why the writer of the Hebrews said in the famous verse, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. That's why John Wesley said, there's nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. A solitary Christian is unchristian because we were created in Christ Jesus to be parts of a body, not to be separate. A solitary Christian is unchristian because we become more unchristian apart from the body, unchristian in our pride and a whole lot of other areas. That's why another man wrote, go to God alone and he'll certainly ask you an embarrassing question. Where are your brothers and sisters? But throw in your lot with us and your focus will go from yourself to others. And you'll end up feeling a lot like I did way back then and it was so powerful that I ended up giving my life to ministry in the church. You'll end up feeling like David did in Psalm 16.3, as for the saints that are on the earth, these are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. A lot of you feel that way. You know, some people say, they say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I always think, and sometimes I, I tell people what I think, I say, well, that's true. But think about it. You don't have to go home to be married either. Right? That's saying the same thing. You don't have to go home to be married. But if you want a healthy marriage, you better go home. Duh. On a pretty regular basis. And if you want a health, to be a healthy Christian, you need to go to church on a pretty regular basis. But most American Christians don't. The average for evangelical believers is once every three weeks. <laughs> it's why one pastor said, he, he, he said this, I don't know why some people change churches. What difference does it make which one they stay home from? So are you a distant attendee in that way? That too can produce contempt. Oh, be of the same mind with one another. Don't keep your distance. There, there are so many excuses people use to justify their distance, their sparse attendance. Many of them are pretty funny if you think about it. In fact, I clipped this from the Denver Post a while back. It's titled, 12 Reasons Why I No Longer Go to Sports Events. It's actually an advertisement for a church Reason number 12, I don't want to take my children because I want them to choose for themselves what sport they like best. Reason 11, since I read a book on sports, I feel I know more than the coaches anyhow. Reason 10, my, people took, uh, my parents took me to too many games when I was growing up. Reason 9, the games are scheduled when I want to do other things. Reason 8, the band played some numbers I'd never heard before. Reason seven, some games went into overtime and I was late getting home. Cardinal sin, right? I've heard that a lot of times. I was sitting with some hypocrites. They came only to see what the others were wearing. Reason five, the referee made a decision with which I could not agree. Reason four, the coach never came to call on me. Reason three, the seats were too hard and not comfortable. Reason two, the people with whom I had to sit didn't seem very friendly. Reason one, every time I went, they asked me for money. So as they say, don't be a stranger. Be of the same mind with one another by not keeping your distance. That's the one side of it. The other side of it, at least, uh, it, it is in the last part of verse 16. It says, don't be wise in your own estimation. The ESV translates it, do not be conceited. This relates to humility as well, but it has kind of a different slant. 
And there are many ways that you could apply this. On one hand, at the beginning of the verse, Paul's saying that if you really are humble, you won't be separated from God's people. You'll be of the same mind with them. And now, on the other hand, at the, la uh, at the last part of the verse, at the end, he says that if you're really humble, you won't be conceited once you do get involved with God's people. If you obey the first part, and then you're in with God's people, don't be wise in your own estimation. And one way you can apply that is this. Once you're in the church, don't become what the church often has a reputation for being, and that is wise in its own estimation. Don't become someone who thinks, for instance, that God is only with your brand of Christianity, with your denomination, your theology, your church, your political agenda, whatever it happens to be. Or maybe God is only with, with your particular form of worship. Many who hold to reform theology really struggle with this one. Each tradition has its characteristic weaknesses, as we all know. And we in the reform tradition must be very careful how we hold our beliefs. Where we wear them, uh, you might say. We must take care that we don't wear them on our sleeve, but in hearts that love people just the same no matter what they believe. May God give us, wrote one theologian, may God give us big hearts. May we have faith in his working in all men, but may we hold that faith without any mixture of compromise. May God give us a crystal clear faith that includes his love for all people, yet mixes with no darkness. A faith that forgives and understands all, yet does not betray one iota of the truth. That's the tension. Some people are wise in their own estimation when it comes to their doctrine. And you can tell it because there's, there's more truth than love. There's more light, uh, uh, heat than light. You might say they, they, their, their truth is easily triggered. It's a narrowness which thinks that God is only with our brand of Christianity. That's why Peter Marshall said, Oh Lord, Years ago, he was the chaplain, some of you may remember him, uh, of the U.S. Senate. He was a Scottish-American preacher like uh, Alistair Begg. Very famous, very popular among fundamental conservative evangelicals. Uh, he was a pastor of New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., a strong Reformed minister. But he knew about the weakness of the Reformed tradition, and so he prayed, O oh Lord, <laughs> where we are wrong, make us willing to change and where we are right, make us easy to live with. <laughs> Some of you struggle with this. Some of us have struggled with it. Some of you struggle, did in the past, but you've grown so much in this area, I've seen it. Oh, may God give us big hearts. without sacrificing one iota of the truth. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not be conceited in your convictions. One of many ways that you can apply this. But the heart of it, as I said, is in the middle of the verse, where Paul writes, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Again, this is one of the most telling of all the signs and secrets of true humility. It's how you work humility deeply into your soul, and that is to associate with the lowly. In fact, that's often what coming to church means. It means uh, associating with the lowly. Like it says in 1 Corinthians 1.26, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame those which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things which are not, so that he may nullify the things which are, so that no man may boast before God. 
that by his doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us everything, wisdom and sanctification and righteousness and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast uh, in the Lord. Church is full of a bunch of lowly people in a lot of ways. Many of you feel that way, whether you... Um, whether because of your present life, your present station in life, or your, or your past, or both. And that's what keeps many away from church. They don't want to associate with the lowly. Maybe that's what's kept some of you away, and maybe sometimes it still does, not realizing that there is a richness in the midst of lowliness, especially when God brings, brings you down. That you'll not get anywhere else and in such churches too you'll find that if you give it a chance do not be haughty in mind but associate with the lowly what does Paul mean by associating with the lowly well it also means what Christ told us at the very end of his ministry he saved the most important for last and so he said in Matthew 24, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will, say to, will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When, when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. That is true Christianity. Reminds me of Mother Teresa, who was a true believer. When my wife, Julie, uh, and our daughter, uh, I, I think it was in what was that, her junior year when you guys went to Africa together of high school? When they went to, on a short-term mission trip to Africa a few years back, they visited Mother Teresa's home for the orphaned and the crippled, which of everything on the trip had by far the deepest impact on the entire team, on a Protestant team in a Catholic place. They really share Christ there. It also impacted the editors of Time magazine. They put it this way a few years back in a cover story they did on her the week after she died. She tenderly cared for the abandoned, the sick, washing their wounds, soothing their sores, preparing them for death. They must feel wanted, loved, Mother Teresa said. They are Jesus for me. So who, who is Jesus for you? Who do you treat like God? Time magazine had uh, this under uh, the, the, the cover story title. She was beloved as a helper to the lowest of the low. That's right out of Romans 12, 16, our verse for today. But she protested that she could do no less than she saw her God in each of them. No wonder they called her a seeker of souls. It's just like some of you who attend church here. Many of you are associating with the lowly. From prison ministries, which has gone on for years, some of you still are, to helping the hungry, to ministering to the disabled, whether the disabled in your own home or with Johnny and friends. It's a beautiful thing. To sawing wood for people who can't afford to do it on their own. It's one of our enduring passions as a church. At least it is among many of you, which is why one of our values say that we seek to thrive, let me read it, as a caring community. And then it goes on to say this, among our members are many who care about people in need. Ministers of mercy who work behind the scenes through quiet acts of service within and outside our church family. And in so doing, 
you are demonstrating and cultivating true humility. The heart of true Christianity. He wants us to be seekers of lowly souls too because he's the seeker of the lowly soul. God is a seeker of lost and lonely souls. It's what we all were once. And maybe that's who you are, a poor soul who's been brought low. Well, he came for you. And we want to be for you too because that's what the church is all about. You know, a man named Johnny Cash uh, knew all about this, which is why he took very seriously Christ's injunction, as some of you know, to visit those who were in prison. He had a powerful prison ministry. He was brought low, and he brought himself low again and again and again all through his career, and then he came to Christ. And he learned about the supreme quality of true Christianity, of associating with the lowly. And so deeply did it impact him um, and what God did with him and what he wants to do with others that he used to tell this story. He just loved this Christmas story that celebrates this truth, the truth that Mother Teresa put into action and that many of you do too. And um, it's a story about a lowly shopkeeper named Comrade. A shopkeeper who did the same. Listen carefully to a story of true Christianity told by one who knew what he was talking about, the story of the Christmas guest. It happened one day at the year's wide end, two neighbors called on an old-time friend. They found his shop so meager and mean, made bright with a thousand boughs of green, and Conrad was sitting with face a-shine when he suddenly stopped as he stitched a twine and said, Old friends, at dawn today, when the cock was crowing the night away, the Lord appeared in a dream to me and said, I'm coming your guest to be. So I've been busy with feet astir, strewing my shop with branches of fir. The table is spread and the kettle is shined, and all over the rafters the holly is twined. And now I will wait for my Lord to appear and listen closely so I will hear his step as he nears my humble place. And I open the door and look in his face. So his friends went home and left Comrade alone, for this was the happiest day he had known. For long since his family had passed away, and Conrad had spent a sad Christmas day. But he knew with his Lord at his, as his Christmas guest, this Christmas would be the dearest and best. He listened with only joy in his heart. With every sound, he would rise with a start and look for the Lord to be standing there in answer to his earnest prayer. So he ran to the window after hearing a sound, but all that he saw on the snowy ground was a shabby beggar whose shoes were torn, and all his clothes were ragged and worn. So Conrad was touched and went to the door and said, Your feet must be frozen and sore. I have some shoes in my shop for you, and a coat that will keep you warmer too. So with grateful heart the man went away, but Comrade noticed the time of day. He wondered what made his dear Lord so late and how much longer he'd have to wait. When he heard a knock, he ran to the door, but it was only a stranger once more, a bent old crone with a shawl of black, a bundle of branches piled on her back. She asked only for a place to rest, but that was reserved for Conrad's great guest. But her voice seemed to plead, don't send me away. Let me rest for a while on Christmas day. So Conrad brewed her a steaming cup and told her to sit at a table and sup. But after she left, he was filled with dismay, for he saw that the hours were passing away, and the Lord had not come as he said he would, and Conrad felt sure he had misunderstood. Then out of the stillness, he heard a cry, Please help me and tell me, where am I? He stood disappointed as twice before, but shook off his sadness and went to the door. It was only a child who had wandered away and was lost from her family on Christmas Day. Again, Comrade's heart was heavy and sad, but he knew he should make this little girl glad. So he called her in and wiped her tears and quieted all her childish fears. Then he led her back to her home once more. But as he entered his darkened door, he knew that the Lord was not coming today, for the hours of Christmas had passed away. So he went to his room and knelt down to pray, and he said, Dear Lord, why did you delay? What kept you from coming to call on me? For I wanted so much your face to see. 
when soft in the silence a voice he heard lift up your head for I kept my word three times my shadow crossed your floor three times I came to your lonely door for I was the beggar with bruised cold feet I was the woman you gave to eat and I was the child on the homeless street You know, Conrad reminds me of some of you who've been waiting for the Lord to come through for you, and he doesn't. But you're associating with the lowly. And it's a powerful thing because that's where God is. He's made that clear. Christ did at the end of his ministry. And he made it clear in what we read in the Old Testament, Isaiah 57:15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place, but also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the heart of the contrite and to revive the heart of the lowly through the church of Jesus Christ. Oh, do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly because that's where God is. It's the heart of humility and the heart of true Christianity. On one side of it is not to be conceited as we look at others. And on the other, we need to live together, not above or apart from one another, but together with the same mind with one another. In many ways, it's the bottom line of is not keeping your distance from the body where we're reminded of these things and where we stir up one another to love and good works like the ones we've been talking about, as it says in Hebrews 10. The bottom line of it all is not keeping our distance from the body, but embracing it wholeheartedly, warts and all. <laughs>